Are you an SRE? A developer? A quality engineer who wants to tackle the challenge of improving reliability in your DevOps? You can enable your DevOps for reliability with Chaos Native. Create your free account at Chaos Native Litmus Cloud. Hello everyone, glad to be here at SRE 2021. And today I'd like to share with you the journey that led us to start using this with tracing in handling performance issues in our system. And I'd like to give you some practical tips on how you can start with distributed tracing and how to effectively use it in your performance investigations. A word about myself, my name is Dotan Horvitz. I'm a developer advocate at logs.io. I've been around as a developer, a solutions architect, a product guy. I'm an advocate of open source and communities in general and the uh, CNCF, the Cloud Native Computing Foundation in uh, particular. I uh, organize a local CNCF chapter in Tel Aviv. So if you're around, do uh, come and uh, visit one of our monthly meetups. Uh, I run the Open Observability Talks uh, podcast. Check it out. And in general, you can find me everywhere at Horowitz. Uh, so if you're tweeting something interesting out of this talk, uh, feel free to uh, tag me. And about us, we pride ourselves in being the masters of observability. Logs, metrics, traces, all around. But we weren't always observability masters. So let's rewind a couple of years back before we had the tracing. Back then, we were the best, we were the masters of logs and metrics. Our system is instrumented inside and out around logging and metrics. We're talking about the system, you know, in microservice architecture, multi-cloud on AWS and on Azure and multi-region, multi-tenant, running at high scale. And we felt we had it all figured out. until the performance alert. So it was a UI performance issue uh, coming from the metrics. Obviously, looking into the metrics, we started seeing uh, the application started loading a little slower uh, with many requests taking longer to respond. And now, as anyone here in the audience, SRE, DevOps, Dev, whoever, know, you need to figure out where it comes from. And our service handles thousands of requests per minute uh, with a serious amount of internal server communications. So this is the conditions that we needed to uh, investigate. And the first attempt, as always, is to turn to the logs for answers. But this time it wasn't that easy. First of all, we had tons of identical data. But worse, it seemed to be like a random decreasing performance issue in different flows all around our, our application. It was really hard to point to one thing in particular and even harder to connect the problem to a specific service. What made it more difficult to investigate through the logs is that the request sequences were pretty long. It was really hard to get the details from the logs and figuring out what called which and how, how the flow goes. Bottom line, our logs weren't enough for this investigation. 
So the second attempt was to enhance the laws. The idea was to add a request ID to each and every one of the logs so that we can look at all the logs and visualize the request, the logs of, this, of all of the same request in Kibana. So if before we couldn't really understand which logs belong to this specific problematic request and some requests were good, some requests behaved oddly, this is a way to bucket it. And it sounds pretty simple, right? Add a request ID, then visualize based on request ID in Kibana. So it wasn't that simple. First of all, it was very difficult to handle the propagation of the request ID. We needed to go into each and every uh, piece of code, uh, service, microservice that we suspected is, uh, has to do with this request and add uh, an incoming parameter to propagate, to bring in the request ID, then obviously uh, uh, put the request ID as part of the logs, but also then uh, send it downstream in any downstream call from that service to any other service or any other operations of the same service. So we needed to handle all this request ID propagation, a big, big headache. So that's in the uh, coding. And then on the visualization side, it was pretty painful to visualize traces using Kibana. Essentially, what we got is a bucket of all the logs that share the request ID, which is nice, but you can't really understand the relationship and, and uh, which invoked which and, and the, the, the relationship between them. And also that it was pretty limited in context. So we had the context of all of them belonging to request ID, to the same request ID, but not much more than that. What you really needed to see was the communication between the services. So we needed better visualization options to track a request and analyze it throughout the request flow. On the coding side, we also needed easier instrumentation because it was a real, real pain for us. And <laughs> there was no chance that we'd be able to convince other teams in charge of other microservices to go along this path and start adding these parameters and handling this request ID propagation. So definitely instru easier instrumentation is another challenge. And then we reached the third attempt. In fact, strike three is a charm. We reach the realization that we need proper distributed tracing. Distributed tracing is, in fact, the tool for pinpointing where failures occur and where, what causes poor performance. And uh, you know, then you can ask questions. Where did the error occur? Where did the performance degradation occur? Where, where's the critical path? These sorts of questions are exactly what distributed tracing is meant to answer. And how does it work? For those in the audience that are not uh, fluent in distributed tracing, uh, the way it works is that each call in the in the call chain creates and emits a span for that specific service and operation. You can think of it as a structured log, uh, for that matter. And this span includes a context: the trace ID, the start time, and the duration of that specific span, the parent span that called it, and, and so on. And this context propagates between the calls uh, in the trace through uh, the system. And that's thanks to client libraries, SDKs, uh, traces, as they, they're known, uh, that take care of that. So if you look at the, uh, on, on the screen on the uh, left-hand side in this uh, uh, tree graph, uh, A, B, C, D, E are all spans, or, or service and operation. And then we can see A is the root span, the one that got the, the client request. And then A calls B. Uh, then B calls C and then D, and then uh, getting back to A, A calls E. So that and the context propagates from A to B to C and, and so on. So this is the context propagation. And each such span, A, B, C, and so on, emits at the end when it's when it ends, it then emits the span uh, outward, outbound. And then there's the backend that collects all these spans that my application emits and reconstructs the trace according to causality and then visualizes it. And the, the typical visualization is the, the famous uh, timeline view or, or gun chart. You can see an example here on the, uh, on the right hand side of the uh, screen. 
the same A, B, C, D, E on, on a timeline, you can see so A, the root span obviously takes the, the whole time from beginning to end because this is the, the full request. But then A called B, B called C, and then called D. And then when B is finished, when B finished, then calling E, and then going back to A and finishing the entire request. So it's, it's very easy and very clear to see that from, from a timeline, timeline view. And this is why it's the preferred view for investigating uh, performance issues in the system. So we realized that we need distributed tracing, which is great. Now the question is, which uh, distributed tracing tool are we going to use? And, and we are open source advocates. We use uh, the Elk stack for logging and Prometheus for metrics and, and so on. And obviously we turned to open source for uh, tracing as well. Uh, we looked into Jaeger and Zipkin, the, the two open source candidates. Um, in fact, we, we started using both of them, but ultimately uh, we chose Jaeger. We still have Zipkin somewhere in our system, but uh, the main path is Jaeger, uh, which seemed to be the leading choice. And also today, uh, recent surveys still show that uh, Jaeger is by far the, the, the leading choice. Here you can see on the screen uh, from DevOps Pulse 2020, it's, it's a yearly survey we run uh, around the DevOps. Uh, and you can see that 33% or more uh, uh, from those using uh, tracing use Jaeger. So Jaeger uh, is the choice. And uh, what's Jaeger just in a nutshell? Um, Jaeger was built by Uber, um, uh, and then uh, they outsourced it. They open sourced it, sorry, uh, and contributed to the CNCF in 2017. And then it uh, reached graduation of the CNCF by 2019. So it's a pretty mature project used in production by, by uh, quite a few uh, companies and organizations. Uh, I won't go into lots of details about uh, Jaeger here, but if you are interested, uh, I, I had the privilege of hosting Yuri Shkuro, the, the creator of Jaeger, uh, on this month's uh, episode of Open Observability Talk. So uh, it was a fascinating talk. Uh, so uh, do check it out, the September 2021 episode for the latest on, uh, on uh, the Jaeger project, on distributed tracing in general, including some very advanced use cases for, for tracing that people usually don't uh, consider. So Jaeger tracing is the choice. And now what we need to do is, before we can start investigating with tracing, we need our application to actually generate trace data. Uh, so let's instrument our application. And we realized that we can't instrument everything from day one. And especially since we have a burning issue uh, you know, uh, to handle the uh, performance uh, investigation. So we took baby steps and started with two front-end services, the Node.js uh, services. We used Jaeger's uh, tracer for Node.js. Um, if you remember, again, Jaeger has a tracer, a SDK per language. So we took the one for Node.js. We used Open Tracing API for, for the code. And we instrumented all our Node.js HTTP layer with tracing, as well as the Node.js frameworks uh, that we use, Happy and Express. Um, a word about Open Tracing API. Uh, it's another uh, open source project under the CNCF that is essentially a, a, an open and vendor neutral uh, API. It's not part of Jaeger, it's, a, it's another project. And the advantage is that since it's a, a standard API, it means that if later down the road we decide to switch uh, the backend from Jaeger to another type of uh, uh, instrumentation, uh, sorry, another type of investigation and analytics uh, uh, backend, it should be pretty simple uh, to replace, just replacing the, the tracer library or uh, the auto instrumentation agent, and, and that's about it. So we shouldn't be having too much coding changes to do. Uh, so going with an open standard is a recommendation. It is important to note uh, that today uh, or these days, open tracing uh, is actually deprecated. Open tracing was merged with open census to create open telemetry. So open telemetry is the future path for instrumentation. If you start today, I'll talk about it later. But back in the day, in, when we were there, uh, the, the mature uh, API was open tracing and we went with that. 
And once we have the application emitting spans, uh, generating trace data, we can go ahead and uh, start investigating our traces. And we open the Jaeger UI. And at first glance, it immediately gave away two major issues that have long been in our code, but we didn't see them until now. It was astonishing to actually see that. And I want to go over that with you. The first thing we saw, which was uh, what you can see here on the screen, this is the Jaeger uh, UI's uh, timeline view. Uh, and you can see here this sort of staircase uh, type of uh, uh, pattern. This is a, uh, uh, an obvious pattern uh, that indicates a serial call sequence. Call A, then when it ends, call B, then it ends, call C, happening sequentially. But in our case, in our system, there was no real need for it to be sequential. We could easily make it, turn it into you know, running concurrently and reduce the overall latency. So we went ahead and made this change. It was very, very easy to do. And the result was a significant application performance improvement right out the bat. It's really uh, amazing. But this, uh, despite the, the improvement, wasn't the root cause of the, if you remember, the, the spike that we talked about before. So we needed to carry on with our investigation to look for uh, the root cause of what triggered the original uh, uh, performance issues in the UI. So we went ahead and filtered the results according to uh, the minimum execution duration, which brought up another performance issue. We saw one request that fetched user data, uh, uh, but its duration varied significantly. Some cases it was as short as 100 milliseconds, and sometimes it was almost 10 seconds long, so two orders of magnitude. We couldn't really figure out why it changes so, so much between uh, invocations. Uh, but one thing for sure is that this request executes from the browser and had to finish before it could, we could render the screen to the user. So that led to a loading time that took even several seconds, definitely something unacceptable uh, for, for UX, for user experience. So this is something that we needed to investigate as part of the, the root cause analysis. And looking in, at this request, we saw that this request triggers uh, a concurrent request to fetch all the relevant user data from various endpoints, uh, where each of those requests goes through uh, several other microservices. So it was pretty elaborate, and some of these downstream microservices were not even instrumented yet, reaching the, the backend code and, and the Java and, and the, the database and so on. And what we found was one key that is read for some user requests, which was mistakenly not cached. And this triggered a call to the database to retrieve it, causing the latency only on the calls requiring this particular key. This is why the behavior was so erratic and inconsistent and, and tricky to put the finger on without tracing. So that was a real aha moment. One side benefit that we got out of it that we didn't even plan on is that we realized that we that Jaeger actually provides us with a live system diagram. We don't need to maintain a sequence diagram anymore and update it every couple of weeks. Jaeger auto detects the uh, calls between the microservices and generates a live system diagram. It always it's always up to date. So that's a definite uh, side benefit that convinced a lot of our engineers and the architects and anyone else in the company to uh, adopt their tracing, finally to understand how our microservice architecture works and the interconnect and, and everything around it. It was love at first sight. Since then, tracing has become a standard practice in the company not just on the front end uh, and Node.js, but also on back end and Java code and uh, database and, and, and frameworks that we use. Uh, we realized that it's crucial. Tracing, this way the tracing is crucial for, for observability. And considering ourselves or wanting to be the masters of observability, 
we started offering it to our own users. So I'd like to move from our own experience to some uh, useful tips on how you can get started with distributed tracing, both on how to instrument uh, and how to investigate uh, and, and find common patterns to watch out for. Let's start with the instrumentation. Don't try to instrument every part of your system from day one. If you have even a modest microservice architecture, it will be too complex. Prioritize the critical services where you need observability the most and grow the coverage over time. It's very common uh, to start with uh, request endpoints in the front end, and then work uh, the way uh, to the back end uh, according to the sequence, but it really depends on your architecture and what's critical in your, in your system. So prioritize your instrumentation. And the next tip on instrumentation is use open telemetry and onto instrumentation. As I said before, open tracing that we used uh, back then was merged into open telemetry. So now uh, op open telemetry or OTEL as it's fairly called is the, the standard. And uh, open telemetry is uh, an observability framework. It provides uh, libraries, agents, collectors, other components that you need to capture uh, telemetry from your services. And it's not just for traces, it's also for metrics and logs. So all the different telemetry signals are under open telemetry framework. So it generates, it collects, and then you can send it to any backend of your choice. You, you want to monitor with Prometheus, you can send it to Prometheus. You want to use Jaeger or Zipkin or other, it's fine. So it's really agnostic to what backend analytics tool you use. <clears throat> Our own, uh, my company, for example, logs.io offers a service that can uh, uh, collect, uh, get uh, open telemetry data and, uh, from the collector and, and use it. It's really, it really doesn't matter. The most important thing is that you have a single API and a single SDK per language for traces, logs, and metrics and also a unified protocol, OTLP, uh, that, that uh, ultimately will become the de facto standard also for uh, transmitting the, uh, uh, the telemetry. So use open telemetry. And the second tip is on this is use auto-instrumentation to ease the coding. You want to do as little coding as possible uh, to, to get the instrumentation done. And you have uh, open instrumentation existing from, from many languages, uh, Java, Ruby. Uh, in fact, I, I just wrote a blog post on auto instrumentation uh, with Ruby, uh, with open telemetry. You're more than welcome to check it out. Uh, in Node.js, we also use the inst auto instrumentation that plugs into the frameworks that we work with, like Happy and Express. But you have for other languages, like for Java, Spring and, and uh, Log4j and others. So, uh, it's, it's very common and it reduces significantly the amount of coding you need to do in order to generate the, uh, uh, the span data. And <clears throat> sorry, if you're new to uh, open telemetry or instrumentation, I wrote a quick guide on uh, open telemetry. Just Google open telemetry guide or you know, click the URL here on the screen. And I think it'd be a very good entry point to uh, understanding how OTEL works and, and getting the links to all the necessary libraries, instrumentation, and SDKs that you need for your system. So use open telemetry, use auto instrumentation. You're covered on the instrumentation side. And now let's move on to tips for uh, uh, investigating performance issues. And the first, seemingly very basic, but many people don't uh, use it uh, well enough, is to use the minimum duration filtering to hone in on problematic traces that you need to look into. You have a simple filter, you just ask, please show me only the traces that take longer than, I don't know, 300 milliseconds to, to execute, and you see only the problematic ones. You can take it further and implement smart tagging on your spans, and then you can also filter by tags. Uh, or some auto instrumentation agents also add and reach the spans with uh, useful tags that you can filter by. So working with the filters will help you uh, flush out the problematic span uh, traces very, uh, very easily. Next, combine and correlate traces with logs. 
Logs together with traces are extremely powerful and logs contain a lot, a lot of more context that can augment what you see from the traces. Uh, and the, the best practice is to uh, add the trace ID to the logs, very similar to what we did with the request ID, but <clears throat> you don't need to take care of generating and propagating it. You just need to take it and uh, use it in your logs because you have the tracer, the instrumentation library, the taking care of it. Uh, the, trace, the trace ID. So just embed the trace ID as part of your logs and make it very easy to correlate your logs, uh, the traces with the logs. And the last uh, advice around investigation is to look for common patterns, <coughs> sorry, in your timeline. So I would like to, this will be the last uh, part of this talk, I would like to look into uh, a few common patterns uh, to look for when inspecting your uh, traces uh, in the timeline view, whether in Jaeger or any other uh, uh, distributed tracing uh, uh, backend tool. The first one we saw that also from our own case is the staircase pattern, which often indicates a sequence of serial calls. Uh, when you see this pattern, you uh, are more than likely want to check if it can be paralyzed something that can run in parallel, or maybe you can use some bulk uh, queries or joins on a database or something to reduce this uh, sequence uh, invocation and, and reduce the overall latency. Um, it could be uh, an issue in the implementation in the code. It could be just a matter of misconfiguration, like a thread pool configuration. So staircase uh, pattern is uh, very common and, and easy to, to resolve, but definitely uh, can take a lot of, uh, of the uh, latency. Second one is uh, span spike pattern. Uh, and this is the pattern of long spans, especially ones that vary uh, uh, significantly between executions, like the one we saw on our case. Uh, and this may indicate either slow queries uh, or caching issues, as or in, in our case, or similar issues. It's, it also helps uh, to focus where you want to put your investigation and efforts into. So when you go about uh, uh, investigating, you want to inspect and optimize the longest span on the critical path. Uh, and you know, reducing this is, is likely to produce the largest benefit on the overall request latency. So this pattern also helps focusing the efforts on where you'll see the most benefits in optimizing uh, latency. The next pattern is a uh, gap between spans. And such a gap can indicate, like you can see here on the, on the screen, uh, a slow uh, inter-service communication uh, that uh, contributes to the latency, or it can also be a service missing instrumentation. For example, it could be that you run a, you send a query to the database, but the, the database driver is not uh, instrumented. So in such a case, you may want to go ahead and uh, uh, instrument the database driver to get more instrumentation. By the way, it's, it's very interesting, actually, just uh, um, this month, uh, a few a couple of weeks ago only, uh, Google contributed uh, SQL commenter uh, open source uh, to OpenTelemetry. So now within OpenTelemetry, there's now a, an open source a, a piece that can automatically generate application-driven uh, metadata to enrich the uh, uh, queries so that you can correlate uh, database queries to application uh, logic much easier. Um, so check it out. The next pattern is uh, spans uh, finishing at the same time, uh, like you can see here on the screen. And this may indicate connectivity issue that is causing timeouts or errors. Uh, or some other artificial constraint like uh, you know, locking issues, uh, you know, several requests waiting on, on a specific lock, and once the lock is released, then uh, you know, all of them finish quickly. So in, in this case, we may want to tune the timeout parameter or investigate why uh, things are taking longer than the timeout that you expected them to take or, or things like that. Um, another important note here about uh, instrumentation is that when you see uh, such cases, it may also uh, uh, call for enhancing the instrumentation around the shared resources. So if it is 
indeed a log or, or I don't know, a call to a database or something like that, you may want to increase the instrumentation there to get better observability into what's happening there and, and also what what's prevents the execution. So um, uh, the last pattern, uh, that was the last pattern. And just to summarize what we've seen, distributed tracing for us was the missing, missing piece in our puzzle for battling performance issues and for observability in general. And if you operate uh, microservices and cloud native system, you are more than likely uh, can benefit from it too. If you're looking into how to uh, go about it, then Jaeger is a great open source option for, uh, for the uh, tracing analytics backend. And for instrumentation, highly recommended to go with the open telemetry. That's the future-proofed path, standard way for, for instrumentation. Uh, by the way, not just for tracing, again, as I said, also for logs and metrics. So uh, definitely look into that and explore as much as possible auto-instrumentation to make your uh, your uh, instrumentation as smooth as uh, and easy as possible. So try and enjoy. Uh, if you have any questions or comments, uh, do uh, feel free to uh, reach out to me here on the chat, Q&A, uh, whichever. You can just uh, reach out to me on, on Twitter, at Horovitz, H-O-R-O-V-I-T-S. Whichever way, I'd be more than happy to uh, answer questions and hear comments and, and get uh, your feedback and your experience about, uh, about this. I'm Dutan Horvitz, and thank you very much for listening.